at a point in time when prophecy is being fulfilled, it is a privilege and an honor, but it is also a very serious responsibility because we're going to be held accountable for the light that we know and that which we could have known as well. So to be a part of God's people, to be alive now, and to be in the light is an honor that we need to be grateful for, but it comes with a responsibility that we cannot shun without being held accountable to the point of our eternal <coughs> life. And it is not a thing to be scaring us, but it is a privilege that we have to see that the Lord has been good to bring us to a knowledge of his love that is demonstrated in the life, the ministry, the death, resurrection, and now the intercession of Christ on our behalf in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. The Lord would have called the Advent Movement for the one purpose of announcing to the world that he was going to begin the final phase of his ministry to bring the great controversy to a close, to bring the sin problem to its culmination. It is a thing that the Lord wants to do because from the entrance of sin, it has been a pain to the heart of the Godhead. And more so since the development, the creation of our world, because when sin entered in our world, then death also entered. <clears throat> All right, we are continuing the book of John, the Gospel of John. <coughs> Pardon me, I, I'm struggling with a little something I'm fighting against to prevent it from taking a full hold in my system. I think I've been doing pretty good over the past couple of months. Normally, winter has been kind of fairly unkind to me, but I have not reached the peak of health yet, and I trust that the Lord will bring me there by the time the crisis breaks so I can survive the seven last plagues. We're, we're not going to be granted any specific special grace during the crisis, and so we have to bring our bodies to the condition where they can survive the rigors of that time of trouble such as never was since they were the nation. Remember, uh, probation will not, uh, probation will close and the, the grace that keeps things in check will be withdrawn. And so we have to live, as the servant of the Lord says, in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. We will not be wholly free from suffering, but we have to be free from the things that would cause us to be exposed to uh, death within the context of separation and our bodies failing under that onslaught. John chapter 7 verses 25 to the end as we continue this chapter we want to read a few more points from the book Desire Ages amongst nears and we're going to read this chapter responsibly, verse 25, John 7, I begin. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this whom they seek to kill? Howbeit, we know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Then cried Jesus in the temple, and told saying, Ye both know me. And he know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom he know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he has sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. And many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. He shall see me, and shall not find me, and where I am, till I cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go, that we shall not find him? Will he go on to the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? What one man of saying is this, and he said, He shall seek me, and shall not find me, and where I am, today he cannot come. 
In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall be represented in water. But this spake ye of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this say, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? And not the scripture said, That Christ come out of the city of David, and out of the town of Bethlehem, where he was. So there was a division among the people because of him. And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? The officers said, Never man speak like this man. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are you also a deceit? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus said unto them, He that comes to Jesus by night, be no one of them. Though for a law judge any man before him, I know if what he doeth. The answer is unto me, and thou also of Galilee, so shall look for all of Galilee, arise and no prophet. All together. And every man went on to his own house. And verse 1 of chapter 8 says, Jesus went on to the Mount of Olives. That was his house. All right? That was his house. That was where he lived during the summer months. And he spent the winter months with Lazarus and his sisters. That is why he was, Lazarus is described as he whom Jesus loved. And that was his family. The, the work of Christ we are continuing to look here in John 7. Just before we are around the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. And he's inviting them to come to him. He knows that this is his by the next year, he's going to be offering himself. This is his last Feast of Tabernacles. And verse 37, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus said unto Christ, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that, that believeth on me, as the scripture have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this faith of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So that last day of the feast, before it came to an end, Christ cried with a loud voice to them that heard, they would understand, hopefully, and come to him knowing that this was the very life of God given to them. Remember the Lord provided water for them in the wilderness? For 40 years. And that was symbolic of Christ. Paul picked it up in 1 Corinthians. Says that rock that followed them was Christ. They were to see that and understand the antitypical. That literal water flowing was representative of Christ, the water of life, which if they would receive, they would never thirst again, as he said to the woman at the well of Samaria. The water that I'm going to give you shall be in you a well of water springing up what? Into everlasting life. And being as literal as she was, like all the those from the Middle East, well, Jacob gave us this well, this well and drank water there from. What water do you have that is better than this? Sticking only at the literal level and failing to see the antitypical message in it, what the Lord wanted them to understand. She was at that level thinking only of quenching her physical thirst. He's now thinking of satisfying the need of the spirit and the soul of men by giving them his very spirit, his very life. Verse 8, 38. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, all of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this speak of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, all through the scripture, the water is used to represent 
the spirit in the nature of water to do what? Flow. It flows. <coughs> and when John was baptizing in Jordan, that was also symbolic of Jesus' baptizing with the spirit. Turn with me to John. Uh, well, <coughs> we're going to further earlier in Matthew chapter 3. Verses 13. <coughs> and 14. Matthew 3, 13 and 14. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? John, Jesus came to John to be baptized. Not because he needed yeah. baptism. Baptism is an external sign of an internal work that has been done. It is a confession of sin, a representation of a dying to one life and a raising to walk in a newness of life. Christ did not need that, but he had to do it for those who would never get the experience. Since he came as our example, there are some who may not, the thief on the cross is a good example, get the opportunity to be baptized. And he was fulfilling all righteousness. And he was making provision for all who will not get that opportunity because he is our example and he's our savior between man and God. And for those who don't get the opportunity, he had to provide it because he had to meet all the demands of the law, both to die as well as to live without sin. This baptism of Christ was symbolic of the baptism of the Spirit. And the baptism of every single human being, that literal water is representative of the Spirit of God that is given to us at our conversion. And remember that the baptism symbolizes that, although the conversion should have, and for those who are genuine, must have occurred before the actual baptism, the change must have taken place before. So the baptism of the water is symbolic of the baptism of the Spirit of God, type, meeting that anti-type. Back to John 3, back to John 7, pardon me. So when a person is baptized, they are immersed in water, and this is a representation of us, that person, us, receiving the Spirit of God. The literal Spirit of God that is given to our life. Now, John is writing <coughs> where after all these events have occurred. So, verse 39, but this speaking of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. And he would have said when he's ascended up, he would send the Spirit. They were to tarry in Jerusalem until they received the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So in this last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and Christ saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He has not changed. God's purpose has not altered, so that invitation still goes out to you and I. Are we thirsty? Mm -hmm. What for? Matthew chapter 6. This is the Sermon on the Mount.
Now the text is, blessed that they that hunger and thirst have righteousness for they shall be filled. I think it's Matthew 5, it's not 6. Five, six instead of six. Mm. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be Amen. filled. Now, the Jews did not see their need, and it's because they were still in the Laodicean condition, believing that they were Abraham's children, they were rich and increased with goods, and had need of nothing. They did not see their need. What Christ had to do was to show them their need, and once you or <coughs> once you recognize your need, you will have it or seek to have it filled. So on this last day of the feast, Christ is extending the invitation and is still extended to us today. They rejected it, unfortunately, and never receive it as a denomination. Adventism is still rejecting that call. As individuals, we don't have to. <coughs> We cannot afford to not hear this invitation or to not see our need and to come to him that we can be satisfied. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believe on me, as the scripture have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And John the Revelator sees a, a river of living water flowing out of the throne of God. And it's not H2O. There's no water in heaven. All right? There's no water in heaven. This is symbolic of the very spirit and the life of God that flows from God's throne to, in, to the entire creation. This will not only be to redeem humanity, but to the entire living creation. The spirit of God, that water flows out to all of God's creation to give life. When we understand this, and we are willing to receive now, this is what God has given us. His very spirit, which is his very life which is his very love that we can be a part of his family and live by the very life of god without it there is no life for that creature the life that we have is probationary and temporal and will cease the much more abundant life that god is offering us in christ is a life that is without beginning and without end it flows from god's throne through Right now, the, the angels, the order, covering church, transport church, and flows right out to every creature. And the redeemed, since they're going to be higher in rank than the angels, a flow is going to be coming to them. Now, that order is going to be rearranged because, without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the greater. Redeemed humanity are going to be higher in rank than angels. And so the life of God is going to flow from God to them. And we are invited to come into that very stream. From the throne of God, having direct access to God, His Spirit, His love, His life, flowing into redeemed humanity. All right, these are ages. In our last presentation, when the Spirit of God brought conviction like a swift, these are ages, amongst near chapter 50, like a swift flash of light, these words revealed to the rabbis the pit of ruin into which they were about to plunge. And for an instant, they were filled with terror. They saw that they were in conflict with infinite power. That is the Spirit of God working to draw every single person to Him. They are at this point now fighting against the Spirit of God on the verge. Pardon me, on the verge of committing the unpardonable sin. All right, we move on now on page. Four, five, 
three. And this yeah. is um, paperback edition, standard page four, five, six. Four, five, seven. Chapter 50, Among Snares. The hearers could not but understand Christ's words. Clearly, there were a repetition of the claim he had made in the presence of the Sanhedrin Council many months before when he declared himself the Son of God. As the rulers then tried to compass his death, so now they sought to take him. But they were prevented by an unseen power which put a limit to their race, saying to them, Thus far shall thou go, and no further. The Spirit of God does this in righteousness because force is not used by God. It is the Spirit of God holding things in check. You would have said that there are 12 hours of daylight, and as long as some of that time remains, he was safe. They could not take his life. And this is the same restraint that holds the passions of sinful human beings in check until probation is closed. When Christ says it is finished and the Spirit of God is withdrawn, all the passions of sinful humanity are going to break out to produce such a form of destruction as cannot be imagined. And this is only dealing with it at the human level. This will also affect nature and this earth as well as the heavens and the powers of the wind, everything. When it's withdrawn from the Spirit of God, it will go beyond. This is a phrase, thus far shall it go no further. That was a boundary that set the limit to the water, the sea. And there's nothing that holds the sea from coming over this planet but that Word of God. And when sin ripens to a certain point and the Spirit of God withdraws, as we saw here uh, <coughs> last year, son, year before. Yeah. Last year. 2012, no, last year, 2013. Sandy occurred in 20. Uh, 12, 2012 and the Spirit of God withdrew and normally hurricanes don't come this far came all the way up to New York and brought in a surge and the water that would normally go thus far no further came all the way into New York and we were at a serious risk it is the Spirit of God that holds things in check and things that seem unlikely under grace become a reality if that grace is withdrawn. That occurred and probation is still open, Christ is still interceding, but it shows what can happen when the Spirit of God withdraws in a measure. All right, next paragraph. Among the people, many believed on him and they said, when Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man doeth? Imagine that, he's right here in front of them Doing the miracles that should have given them enough evidence. Now, in the past, they would have had miracles performed by Elijah, Elisha, and others. <coughs> right, but they were one-on-one -on -one here and there. Here you have a servant of the Lord daily for months throughout the summer, summer period performing countless miracles. Now, how many more than that do you need? Step to Christ. These are ages tells us that he passed through villages and healed every single person. How many more miracles than that do you need before you believe that this is the Son of God? Their hearts were hardened against conviction and the strongest evidence that God could give to them was not enough to convict them. Because they were bent on a wrong conception of God and wanted to do things their way. When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man doeth? Now, if this was not Christ and another Christ came and did the same amount of miracles or a little more, would they believe? No. The leaders of the Pharisees who were anxiously watching the course of events caught the expressions of sympathy among the throne. Hurrying away to the chief priest, they laid their plans to arrest him. They arranged, however, to take him when he was alone, for they dared not seize him in the presence of the people. Again, Jesus made it manifest that he read their purpose. 
yet a little while, am I with you, he said. And then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me. Where I am, thither ye cannot come. Soon he would find a refuge beyond the reach of the scorn and hate. He would ascend to the Father, and be again the adored of the angels, and thither his murderers could never come, because with the spirit they had, it would disqualify them from making it to heaven. And this is not him saying to them that he's boasting. It is extending to them an invitation to know that the time and opportunity you have to receive me is running short. Receive it while it is there. Take advantage of this. This is your last opportunity to be saved. And he gave them another evidence that he was Christ by reading their minds again. But their hearts were getting harder and harder. Snarily, the rabbi said, Whither will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go on to the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? They didn't know what a blessing it would be for the Gentiles. And they did not know or appreciate what was given to them now. And when it was gone, it would be too late. Little did these travelers dream that in their mocking words, they were picturing the mission of Christ. All day long, he had stretched forth his hands onto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Yet he would find, yet he would be found of them as that saw him among the people that had not called upon his name. Thank you. Let me read it again. All day long he had stretched forth his hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Yet he would be found of them that saw him not. Among the people that had not called upon his name, he would be manifest. Romans 10, 20 and 21. Now, turn there. And this principle will not change. The majority of God's people are not found among Adventists who are supposed to be God's people. Paul, quoting from Isaiah, Romans 10, 20, 21. But Isaiah is very poor and said, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he said, all day long have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gained same people. And that can be applied now to modern Israel, which is Adventism. From 1844, the Lord had been stretching up his hand onto a disobedient and gain same people. Now, are we individually part of those to whom the Lord has been extending his hand and we have not been receiving? All day long, have I stretched forth my hands onto a disobedient and gain same people? Now, we would be very offended if we come to extend our hand to, for a handshake to greet a brother or sister and they pass us, but you know that's trouble. You don't even acknowledge my presence. We would feel insulted. This is how God's people, he put that in brackets, have been treating him for a long time. We in Adventism, as well as the Jews, as is written here by Isaiah, the Lord extended mercy to receive his people. And he has his hand extended as an invitation all day long. And they walk by without receiving. To us in Adventism, to us individually, have we reached out to grasp the hand of Christ that has been extended to save us. Peter reached it and it saved him from drumming because it was extended to him. And that was an emergency. It was a matter of life and death for him physically. And so it became urgent. He reached out and grabbed it. It is the matter of life and death to us. Spiritually, are we going to reach out and grab it? Or are we going to let it remain extended and ignore the offer? All day long. And that day of opportunity was about to close for the Jewish nation. And they did not know. Back to Desire Ages. Many who were convinced that Jesus was the Son of God were misled by the false reasoning of the priests and rabbis. 
These teachers had repeated with great effect the prophecies concerning the Messiah that he would reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. <coughs> and before his ancients gloriously that he would have dominion also from sea to sea and from river to river unto the ends of the earth. Isaiah 24, 23 and Psalm 72 verse 8. They were applying the reign of the second coming to the first because that is what they wanted that at that point in time. And also the reign of Christ is not only here literal but spiritual because he would extend salvation to the Gentiles. They thought it would only apply to them and they misappropriated it and missed it when it was there for them. Their day of opportunity was closing and didn't see. Continue. Then they made contemptuous comparisons between the glory here pictured and the humble appearance of Jesus. The very words of prophecy were so perverted as to sanction error. Had the people in sincerity studied the word for themselves, they would not have been misled. <coughs> The 61st chapter of Isaiah testifies that Christ was to do the very work he did. Chapter 53 sets forth his rejection and sufferings in the world. And chapter 59 describes the character of the priests and the rabbis. But they did not see all these. They only picked up the text that suit them. Chapter 63 of Isaiah testifies that Christ was to do the very work that he did. I remember when we mentioned it, he said, he read it in Isaiah, in Luke 4, stood up and read, 61. the Lord have anointed me. 61. So thank you. 61, that's when he would begin his ministry and going on to 62 and 3, this is all of the Lord Christ, the work and the ministry, the healing, everything. All of these were fulfilled. And 53 sets forth his rejection and sufferings in the world. And that is not only for them, that is for me and you, all mankind. Chapter 59 describes the character of the priests and the rabbis. The leaders would not believe. Next paragraph. God does not compel men to give up their unbelief. God does not compel men to give up their unbelief. He cannot do that because compulsion is found only under Satan's government. Before them are light and darkness, truth and error. It is for them to decide which they will accept. Now this is the principle of God's dealing because it's a principle in his character. From the beginning, when God made everything in righteousness, the angels were free to remain in that righteousness. And they were also free to reject it and accept what Satan was proposing. He could not compel them to remain in righteousness, nor could he co compel them not to believe Satan's beliefs. And this is bringing it right down to us today. Every single individual, that is why there's going to be the loud cry, to bring the message to the focus of the world so that everybody can have an opportunity to hear both sides and decide. God does not compel men to give up their unbelief. Before them are light and darkness, truth and error. It is for them to decide which they will accept. The human mind is endowed with power to discriminate between right and wrong. God desires that man shall decide from not, not from shall not decide from impulse, but from the weight of evidence, carefully comparing scripture with scripture. Now the previous two studies in this book, we saw how the Spirit of God has taught us we should study the word. Get the text. Concentrate the energies of your mind on that text to ascertain the thought that God has put in that text for you. All right? Concentrate the energies of your mind on that text until you get the thought that God has put into it because the words were not inspired. It is the thought of God that is contained therein. Now, God wanted us intelligent, and intelligence involves 
freedom of choice and you have to respect that choice otherwise there is no intelligence if God did not give you freedom of choice he would have given you an ultimatum do this or else but there is no ultimatum with God it is free choice and so we are required to use our intellectual capacity I, I read a statement one of the Jewish writers she says idiots are exempt all right so idiots are exempt those who do not have the capacity because of the same problem to study and understand truth they are exempt from being accountable for knowing and choosing the great controversy will allow us to know that in God's way he will deal with those cases in righteousness but idiots are exempt but all who have intelligence are responsible for what they believe what they know and where they stand the human mind is endowed with power to discriminate between right and wrong even the wicked it is only a serial killer after the first murder he has regrets there's no such thing as a person that has no remorse that comes after years of killing the voice of conscience all right that is why they do it in secret because they know it is wrong but after you keep doing it your mind becomes desensitized to the enormity of what you're doing so that by a certain time then you can keep doing it without any real compunction because you have destroyed that sensibility of humanity in you that let you know what you're doing is wrong. <laughs> the human mind is endowed with power to discriminate between right and wrong. But even animals know right and wrong. What? If you have a pet and it does something that you have tried not to do, when you come what it does, Hi. it runs. And how is there has a sense of it has transgressed a law that you have outlined to it, and even though it can't verbalize it, it knows what it has done is wrong, and it runs out. Yeah. If the animal does that, are we below the animal? No, we're not. God designs that men shall not decide from impulse, but from weight of evidence, carefully comparing scripture with scripture. Now, the amount of evidence that Christ gave to these scribes and Pharisees and to the Jewish nation, you could not ask for any more. You could not ask for any more. Had the Jews been willing me. Sorry. Had the Jews led by their prejudice and compared written prophecy with the facts characterizing the life of Jesus, they would have perceived a beautiful harmony between the prophecies and their fulfillment in the life and the ministry of the lowly Galilee. Mm -hmm. Now, you have two evidences. We are told in the mouth of two witnesses, everything is confirmed. Mm -hmm. You have the written sure. scripture and how you have a living demonstration of it. What more evidence could they require? Show a sign. If he had given them a sign, they would ask for another sign. And if he given them another, they would ask for another sign because they were not inclined to believe. They did not want to accept him as the Messiah, so they would have rejected all the evidence given. And when he gave them the crowning evidence, raising Lazarus, they rejected it to the point where they decided to get rid of the evidence. We're going to kill Lazarus again, and we're going to kill you too. Next paragraph now comes down to our day and age. Many are deceived today in the same way as were the Jews. Religious teachers read the Bible in the light of their own understanding and traditions. <coughs> and the people do not search the scriptures for themselves and judge for themselves as to what is truth. But they yield up their judgment and commit their souls to their leaders. Dangerous position. That is why denominations are dangerous because they have a, a set rule of conduct and a set of doctrines and beliefs which are their code. And if you don't comply with it, you are an apostate. Apostasy has nothing to do with a denomination. Apostasy has to do with your relationship with God. There is no sin 
in departing from a denomination, whatever that denomination is. Mm -hmm. Okay? Sin is transgression of whose law? Oh, God. God's law. Not the law of any body of believers or any denomination. It has to do with a departure from the Lord. And the danger of the denominational mentality is that we are right, and if you do not comply with us, you are lost. God has never established anywhere in his word that that is a principle in his word. Here we have it clearly because we're going to have to stand before the God individually. And we're going to not going to stand there as Adventist, Methodist, Baptist, <coughs> Roman Catholics, whatever. We're going to stand there as what? Individuals. Let me, let me start that paragraph again. Many are deceived today in the same way as were the Jews. Religious teachers read the Bible in the light of their own understanding and traditions. And we read in Great Controversy 594 from the fact that tradition and misinterpretation have obscured the teaching of the Bible concerning the character and the government of God, his dealings with sin. It's plainly revealed in God's word how sin entered and what it would produce and tradition and misinterpretation obscured God's character and government. It is. It continues to be a problem. Every traditional belief must be tested by the Word of God. Don't believe something because a denomination says it. And I, I love, I love y'all because you don't believe me because you say I love the other that y'all can challenge me and question it. Because you have to answer to God for yourself. All right. And there's no sin in questioning. God made you as an intelligent being, and He expects you to be. Intelligent. Amen. Any leader or any group that expects you to follow them blindly is a blind leader and a blind group. Amen. Mm -hmm. That is why God gave you two eyes to see. Mm -hmm. Examine it and know for yourself whether it is true or not based on the word of God. And he made the word available to us in our language. Amen. The papacy blinded the world by keeping the, putting the Bible in Latin. And only they could understand Latin so they had to take what they told you. God through Martin Luther took it out of Latin, put it in German, and from German to English, and you have it in so many different forms now and available, and people are still being led astray. In, in Great Controversy again, she says, it is the first and the highest duty of every rational being to find out what is true for themselves and believe and teach that truth to others. Amen. Your first and highest duty as a rational being is to find out what is truth for yourself. If you don't, somebody's going to lead you astray. Amen. And the people do not search the scriptures for themselves and judge for themselves as to what is truth. But they yield up their judgment and commit their souls to their leaders. What a dangerous position to stand, to take. No man on this planet should be above question when it comes to belief and practice. Because you have the word of God for yourself, study it for yourself, and what he preaches or teaches does not square with the word of God, reject it. Now you can accept the person and reject the belief in them. Amen. Because you disagree with me that you have something against the person. Amen. What you are saying to me does not harmonize with the word of God, and I will not accept I cannot accept it. The preaching and teaching of his word is one of the means that God has ordained for diffusing light. But we must bring every man's teaching to the test of scriptures. How many? Amen. Every man. Every man. How many? Every, every man. man teaching to the test of the scriptures. And the reason why churches are dead is because the members don't do that. Amen. Whoever will prayerfully study the Bible Desiring to know the truth that he may obey will receive divine enlightenment. Amen. Now, there are some who want to study the Bible not to obey them, but to, to generate controversy and to pull down others. You can study the Bible for the wrong reason. The, the reason for studying God's word is to know it, understand it, obey it, and allow it to transform you. Amen. There are people that will study the Bible for all kinds of reasons. 
And we have to know it because come Christ's time, you're an Adventist and you brought the board. The lawyer will go home and do the history of Adventism and know all the doctors that come and question you and trip you up on it if you don't know what we believe. That is his job, you know. His job is not to study it to know truth or to come to know the Lord. His job is to win the case. And when he studies the history of Adventism and can point out to you with aren't you all the this organization that said that Jesus was coming in 1844? What happened? You still going here? But this is a positive organization. What are you talking about? All of these are things that they will know and remember and question. Lawyers are very sharp thinkers mm -hmm. and they will do anything to win the case. We must be able to, when we are finished, and we are not going to understand to present the truth to get ourselves from being locked up. When we finish, the lawyers say, This is going to be regular. I'm done with y'all. I take a stand with God's people. Should be able, based on your witness to Him, I see the truth and give up his position and take a stand with God's people. But we have to know it because they are going to be examining, not for the purpose of knowing truth, but to win the case, prove us wrong. Amen. Now, do you know where you're going to be? You know who you're going to have to defend the truth against? Mm -hmm. No. That means you must be ready to defend it against the best minds on the planet. Amen. And we, when we study the Spirit of God's promise, it, He will bring to your mind mm -hmm. all that you need. Mm -hmm. Amen. To. Amen. But you can only have something brought to your mind if you have studied it and Amen. it is in your subconscious. The Spirit of God searches, searches how many things? All the what? Deep, deep, deep down in your subconscious where you don't even know that you have things written in God's Spirit. Deep, deep down in our minds, in your hard drive, yeah. right? In the hard drive of the human brain, down there where we don't even know. Truth is stored when we study it and the Spirit of God can get down in there and pull it up. But you have to write it in there. You cannot pull up something from the hard drive that has not been recorded Amen. in the hard drive. Whoever will prayerfully study the Bible, desiring to know the truth that he may obey it, will receive divine enlightenment. If any man, he will understand the scriptures. If any man will have to do his will, he shall know of the teaching. The desire then, as we read uh, last week as well, that understanding truth does not depend so much upon strength of intellect as upon pureness of purpose. Amen. So you don't have to be an Einstein to study God's word. God gave the spirit to inspire the word and he promises the spirit to teach us the word and to bring it to memory. James 1 verse 5. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God to give it to all men help. How? Liberally. Liberally. Liberally and upbringing. God is not a stingy person. Amen. He does not have to sit down and say, well, there are seven billion people on the planet and therefore you need to give them each one an up so that everybody can get some. No. There's enough of the Spirit of God that I can have an overflowing amount and the, do not leave you short. Give it to all men liberally and upbringeth not and it shall be given him. Because we're told by Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 that God loves what kind of a giver? Cheerful. Cheerful. Now, how can he love a cheerful giver and he be stingy? It would be contrary to his very character. And the Spirit is going to be given to us without measure. On the last day of the feast, the officers sent out by the priests and rulers to arrest Jesus return without him. They were angrily a question. Why have you not brought him? With solemn countenance, they answered, never man speak like this, like this man. Mm -hmm. now, now, if these guys came with one purpose, to arrest Jesus, stood in his presence, heard him speak, now the Spirit of God was brooding over it. You know, there are many times we are told that when Jesus was ministering, the Spirit of God was present to heal. Not only physically, but spiritually. You know? The Spirit of God was brooding over that environment and bringing conviction. And a mind that did not set up a barrier would be convicted and be feel the pull and would be drawn to him. And these guys forgot, forgot their mission. 
in trance, but he's teaching, having never heard truth presented that way, and on top of it, the Spirit of God is drawing them, they were listening and forgot all about what they were there for. And when they went back, where is it? Who? Oh. Sorry, forget all about that. I was so taken with this truth. Yeah. I didn't even think I could arrest this person. Which shows that if the Pharisees and the scribes had not come with a mind that was closed and a big barrier up against it, they too would have been drawn yes. to him. Amen. The soldiers came to arrest Jesus. Let me see if I find any fault in this man's one. If you need a rest, this guy, guy you don't need no rest. What do you rest this guy for? Mm -hmm. Never man speak mm -hmm. like this one. Anytime, therefore, that a person is not convinced, it is not before because Christ has not pulled them, or because they have resisted that pull of the Spirit. Omnipotent power was here pulling on them, and they forgot their mission as soldiers and became students in the school of Christ. Never man speak like this man. Next paragraph. Hardened as were their hearts, they were melted by his words. Amen. They were what? Melted. This tells you that the hearts and scribes of Pharisees, I, I don't know, well, if I had to make a rock, because the rock can melt with the temperature of God about 2,000 degrees. All right, iron will melt, steel will melt, aluminum will melt. Is there anything on this planet that don't melt? If the temperature is right, it will melt. These guys' hearts were so hard that it could not be melted. Minds were fixed and locked in. Hardened as were their hearts, they were melted by his words. While he was speaking in the temple court, they had lingered near to catch something that might be turned against him. But as they listened, the purpose for which they had been sent was mm -hmm. forgotten. Has that ever happened to you? Yeah. You go on somewhere to do something else, and something else occupies your attention. When you get back, you really feel <laughs> completely changed. Your mind is gone away <clears throat> from that which you were about to because something else has engrossed your attention. And they were here looking to hear something to use against Christ. And they were hearing truth that they had never heard before, and their minds were no longer even thinking about looking for error. They were taken. These are the words that I was longing to hear for a long time. Those that sent me never said anything to me like this. This man does not need a rest. I need to go back and arrest those who sent me. Bring them here, let them learn, and hear something. Never mind speak like this man. If you hear a person speak with an extent that it is something you've never heard before and it doesn't impact upon you, you are close to probation. Closure. Hardened as they were, they had not heard this kind of ministry before and when it was heard, they yielded to me. Which shows that what they really needed to know really was mm -hmm. the truth of God from the word of God. The Pharisees were giving them but we read it, there's no tradition and misinterpretation and all kind of rubbish. Rubbish. Thank you, Brother Andrew. Still. No, no, that is the same thing that the world is to hear. Here. longing to hear right now, you know. The majority of what they hear from the majority of preachers has nothing to do with any substance. They have never heard. Now, when you, if you listen to T.D. Jakes, if you listen to Joyce Meyer, if you listen to Billy Long, do you hear anything different? No. <laughs> People want to hear words that they've never heard before. The pure, unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ, the power of God on the salvation from sin, and it's going to make a difference. And that is what God is preparing us for now, to be able to give that message that they will hear and, and accept. But as they listened, their purpose for which they had been sent was forgotten. They stood as men in trance. Christ revealed himself to their souls. They saw that which priests and rulers would not see. Now, no, she says, would not see him. Not could not see him. Would not see. They would not let their eyes be opened by the Spirit of God. Would not see. And the blindest person, not you, cannot see. Person who would not see. Because the blind man in John 9 
saw by faith, and then he saw physically. Pharisees, all of them, their eyes are open, and they were blind. And they asked Jesus, are we blind also? He said, yeah. Because here he is standing before you, both your eyes open, and you see him, and you don't see him, and you wonder if you're blind, but that's the nature of being blind, you can't see. That which, they saw that which priests and rulers would not see. Humanity flooded with the glory of divinity. They returned so filled with the thought, so impressed by his words, that to an inquiry, why have you not brought him? They could only reply, reply never man spake like this man. It reveals to us the ministry of Christ that was filled with the spirit and the life and the love of God and was irresistible except to those whose minds were locked in. Locked in sin and the darkness and refusing to yield to. Never man speak like this man. What a speaker Christ was. And it was not a matter of it being flowery. It was content and truth. Now, next paragraph shows that they were there because they willingly rejected it. The priests and rulers, on first coming into the presence of Christ, had felt the same conviction. Now you can't. Because the Spirit of God was flowing from Christ. Now John was John was holy, right? John had reached a very high level of sanctification. When Christ came into John's presence to baptize him, and what he says that John had never felt such an awe from a person. All who'd ever come into his presence were thieves and murderers and liars and everything. All kind of bad people needed to be baptized. When Christ came into his presence, he felt the presence of the love of God flowing out from Christ in him and he backed off. He did never felt such a such a presence before. So I don't know if you've ever come across a real evil person. You've ever come across a really, really bad behaved person? When you are in the presence, you know. Anyway. Right? There's something about them that have you a little bit tense. On tense, uneasy, uncomfortable water. The atmosphere of evil from the demon is there. You feel it. So too the Spirit of God. When the Spirit of God is dwelling within that person, to that extent, you cannot but feel the presence. They, on first coming into the presence of Christ, had felt the same conviction because the Spirit of God emanating from him. It was given to him without measure, John 3, 34. Emanating from him. Hold them. They felt the conviction. They said, no, this is not an ordinary, this is not an ordinary person. But they didn't want to receive the conviction. Continue. Their hearts were deeply moved and the thought was forced upon them never mind speak like this man listen to the difference now but they stifled the conviction of the Holy Spirit they did what? Stifled. stifled the conviction of the Holy Spirit they could not say that they didn't, they were, they didn't know a word convincing them it was there but they stifled it now enraged that even the instruments of the law could be should be influenced by the hated Galilee they cried are you also a deceit? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believe on him? But these people who know if not the law are cursed. The problem was not the ministry of Christ. The problem was hard hearts that would not be convicted. How could these leaders, supposedly the spiritual leaders of the, of the nation, feel the Spirit of God and reject it? because they were not true spiritual leaders. They were not controlled by the Spirit of God and did not want that control because it would put them where they didn't want to be, humble and teachable. But after they stifled it, no, they were enraged because you lack the love, then the other 
spirit will take over, which he says. Now, enraged that even the instruments of the Lord should be influenced by the hated Galilean, they cried, Are you also a deceiver? How can you hate a person when righteousness is flowing from that person? That means that you have to be evil. Even the civil government would like it if everybody in this, this, the, the, the kingdom was righteous. If the whole of America was righteous, the government would be very happy because it would be much cheaper to maintain this country. Some of the biggest expenses of this government is FBI, CIA, and the PD. Law enforcement is a large organization because it takes that much to keep it, to keep the nation from destroying itself. And the president will be able to walk free. You will need the security detail and his secret services and all of it. You have to spend all that money. It would be far more economic and money could be directed then to better things in terms of developing um, the nation and protecting the people and providing. A large expense of governments out there has to do with policing and security. Here they were. Feeling the presence of God, the Spirit of God, pulling them and resisting them. Right. Now, here we come back to the principle of the individual and its accountability. Those to whom the message of truth is spoken seldom ask, is it true? But by whom is it advocated? What, what should we ask? Is it true? What is the first thing you should ask about something that is presented? Is it true? Is it true? Don't ask who wrote the book. Don't ask which organization it belongs to. Your first concern is, is it truth? People want to know who wrote that book. Who is he? Which organization he belongs to? Where did he go to school? Those to whom the message of truth is spoken seldom ask, is it true? But by whom is it advocated? as if that has something to do with truth. Multitudes estimated by the numbers who accept it, and the question is still asked, have any of the learned men or religious leaders believed? And it happens to every work that the Lord starts on. So when William Miller came, people were asking the same question. When Martin Luther started up against the papacy, they were asking the same question. <coughs> <clears throat> Men are no more favorable to re real godliness now than in the days of Christ. They are just as intently seeking earthly good to the neglect of eternal riches. And it is not an argument against the truth that large numbers are not ready to accept it, or that it is not received by the world's great men, or even by the religious leaders. This is the danger of the denominational mentality. They will say to you, well, our theologians and our scholars have not examined that, and so it is not true. We do not believe it, and it's not true. Its <laughs> truthfulness has nothing to do with whether or not you believe it. It is determined whether or not it is by the word of God. This is the danger of the denominational mentality. It locks you in to a set doctrine, teaching and belief, and if it, what you're saying does not harmonize with that, <coughs> then you get resistance. The first question is not who's presenting it. The first question is, is it truth? truth? And, and we as a movement are alike because a teaching on the character of God was being studied. It did not come under 27 fundamental doctrines, and it was rejected. As soon as you put a stop, that's why God does not give us an amount of doctrine, because if you have 27, and other light come, you can say, well, that can't be light, because it's not part of our 27. And this was repeated in Adventist history. The first angel, well, William Miller didn't even know anything about angels. Or William Miller was just preaching on the second coming of Christ. The term first angel was applied by the spirit of prophecy. 
And then the second angel followed, and they didn't even know anything about angels. The third established that message, and he was going to take it forward beautifully. Thereafter, the servant Lord applied those terms to the Advent movement, first, second, and third angels, and they have taken that and put a full stop behind those three and said there are no more to come. If they had gone on, they would see, and there's not only three, but it's seven altogether. As soon as that mentality is developed, it stops you from seeing more light and it prevents you from being in harmony with God. God has not put any full stop upon any light, any subject. Every subject that is studied in the Word of God will continually unfold and keep getting brighter and brighter. As soon as you have a structured uh, teaching and lock it in, you're going to reject light when it comes because it does not fit into your thinking. It's not for us to determine when and where. So we're going to close with this paragraph and we read it again. So let me go back then to the previous page. Many are deceived today in the same way as were Jews. Religious teachers read the Bible in the light of their own understanding and traditions. And the people do not search the scriptures for themselves and judge for themselves as to what is truth. But they yield up their judgment and commit their souls to their leaders. The preaching and teaching of his word is one of the means that God has ordained for diffusing light. But we must bring every man's teaching to the test of scripture. Whoever will prayerfully study the Bible, desiring to know the truth, that he may obey it, will receive divine enlightenment. He will understand the scriptures. If any man will live to know the will, he shall do. To do his will, he shall know of the teaching. Now back to this other paragraph. Those to whom the message of truth is spoken seldom ask, is it true? But by whom is it advocated? That, those are not our questions. The first question, the only question we have to ask, is it true? When God sends a message to you, don't question the messenger. That is not your responsibility. Don't tell the Lord how to do his work. That is why the work of God has been failing. Because the Pharisees were saying to Jesus, how can God bypass all of us and give you a message? Why can't he bypass you? Is he limited to you? No, he's not. Multitudes estimated by the numbers who are accepted. And that is still a problem because people think that the the bigger the church, the larger the number, then it must be true. Mm. All right? The bigger the church, the larger the numbers, then it must be true because a lot of people believe it. The history of this planet shows that the majority are normally in the realm. All right? The majority are normally in the realm. You will check the history and you find that those who survive are always in the minority. From the flood all the way down to the end. Normally it is the minority. And minority don't mean that you're true. You know? Okay, if you're not looking at numbers, because it's a minority, that don't mean that you're true. You can have a handful of lives. <laughs> <coughs> Multitudes estimated by the numbers who accept it, and the question is still asked, have any of the learned men of re or religious leaders believed? Now, the reason why people like large numbers is because they feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. All right? It takes a lot of character to stand out as an individual. Mm -hmm. And it takes personal devotion and commitment to be studying, to search, to find truth so that you know for yourself. But it's very easy to walk into a vast yeah. When you have a big denomination, a lot of members, you can walk in there and be hit quite easily. Mm -hmm. Men are no more favorable to real godliness now than in the days of Christ. They are just as intently seeking earthly good to the neglect of eternal riches, and it is not an argument against the truth that large numbers are not ready to accept it, or that it is not received by the world's great men, or even by religious leaders. Do not let anything, any factor, numbers, or a particular person be a deciding factor as to whether or not something is true. The only standard for deciding truth is the word of God. And 
one more paragraph. This one beginning in these thoughts. God does not compel men to give up their unbelief. God does not compel people to do anything at all. God does not compel you as far as force is concerned. <coughs> Pardon me. God does not compel us to receive truth. He cannot compel us to be saved. He does not compel us to give up our unbelief. That is for us to decide. <coughs> uh, let me personalize it. God does not compel us to give up our unbelief. Before us are light and darkness, truth and error. It is for us to decide what we will accept. The human mind is endowed with power to discriminate between right and wrong. God designs that men shall decide, shall not decide from impulse, but from the way of evidence. Amen. Carefully comparing scripture with scripture. Had the Jews, no, I said let me personalize so. Had the Adventists led by their prejudice and compared written prophecy with the facts characterizing the life of Jesus, they would have received a beautiful harmony between the prophecies and their fulfillment in the life and the ministry of the lowly Galilee. And that is for me and you today as it was for them back then. And the life of Christ testifies to the character of God, the kind of person that God is, and the life that God would have us to understand because the great controversy is centered around Christ. It started with Satan's rejection of Christ as the mediator between God and man. Why is this person who is apparently on my level, with the same height, glory, why can he go in and I cannot go in? The question of the controversy started around Christ and it will be finished around Christ. So the Lord says he's sworn, Philippians 2, every knee will bow and everything confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. So Satan questioned Christ's position. How can he be there? And men are still today questioning the position of Christ. You want us to believe that a simple Galilean person back then made a difference to the world? You expect us to accept this position. The great minds of the world think that Christ is beneath them. And God has sworn he will present Christ. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that will not be by force. So our destiny is determined by whether or not we acknowledge Christ as Lord of our lives. Now not just to know it intellectually, but if we do that, but we don't allow him to be Lord in terms of control and receive the very principle of life that is in him that he came to give to us, then we don't acknowledge him as Lord. And it will make no difference when it comes to our salvation. Questions or comments before we close with a word for Brother Stephen? Um, that paragraph, 459, uh, paragraph 5, she says, men are no, no, sorry, but multitudes estimated by the numbers who accept it. And the question is still asked, have any of the learned men or religious leaders believed? And I realized that this principle that uh, began with Israel uh, has, has really pervaded, there are a lot of things that have pervaded society because of what Israel held to as traditionally. And you realize that this is the way in which uh, many people today, especially in regards to science and faith, uh, rely upon this principle. So they, so they look and say, well, um, you know, does Richard Dawkins believe it, or does so-and-so, does this professor believe it? If it's not so, because they, they go and say, well, they, and they will make insults, like say, um, oh, well, creationism is something that George Bush believes in, so you know, you can't really, really uh, accept it or believe it to be so. You know, they, they make these, they throw these insults because certain people believe it or something. And they, they are in effect trying to determine truth by who believes it or who don't believe it. Mm -hmm. And that has nothing to do with it because it was here before George Bush, it was here before Richard Dawkins, it was here before Stephen Hawking, it was here before Einstein. And it will continue to be here after they are gone. 
So our standard for it is not on who believes, whether the person is a great intellectual or the person is a novice. It is the word of God that determines truth. And that, those are the questions we are to have. Is it truth? And that's why she said that um, that it will be this age that will be the easiest to deceive because they're so dependent on, you know, who, whoever is saying it that they're going to accept it. And I, I realize that the world, as much as it thinks it is free from a paper mindset of depending upon men to tell this and that, they're not really free. They're back into that dark ages thing. That is, that is one of the reasons why we are going to be brought to a point individually to decide. And that is why in the final body of believers, there is no denomination mentioned. It is just a numbering. All right? The final body are numbered, 144,000. You have to strive to be in the number. And I wouldn't be surprised if between now and the local credit is a church that comes up and takes its name 144,000. <laughs> but that, that would not change the principle. It is not a name. They are just numbered. And we must strive to be in that, which means it's not going to be an easy thing to achieve. It's very easy to get into the broad way. Broad is the way, and wide is the road that leads to destruction. But when it comes to the straight, and we, straight here don't mean S T R A I G H T, straight line. Straight is difficult, S T R A I T. That straight, difficult path, only a few are going to be willing to do that. It, is, it requires sacrifice on your part to get up daily, early in the morning, and find time to study the Word of God and to know it for yourself. And it's easy to go and join the church and hear whatever comes down the pipeline and you accept that. So when it comes to the end, the Lord says, they are going to be numbered, strive to be among the 144,000. They are not necessarily named. Sister John. So what um, we see here in the chapter, how it is um, in the Pharisees and the Sadducees, these Jewish leaders, how they operate and how their hearts, their minds were so hardened. It seems that um, the, re the rejection of the truth has been, I uh, would say, uh, ingrained in them from centuries of apostasy. Because um, when, you, when you look at it, we, see, we always see ma men will follow God and then they'll move away because that's, that, that's the problem. When it is they don't follow on, they don't abide, they don't continue and don't pass on the knowledge to the, the posterity or, or you, know, you don't acknowledge the obedience of God and teach uh, your, your descendants that, you know, you end up in apostasy and lose the information. And it seems from the book of uh, Malachi to Matthew, there's a big, a big gap, centuries of, um, uh, it seems to be um, unrevelation or no revelation concerning uh, why these Jewish leaders reach that level. I believe, I don't know, uh, from what I'm understanding, uh, after Malachi and so on, the Jewish leaders they had their situation after the apostasy, the Maccabees and so on. I don't know, I guess it would be in, in, the, in, the, um, in the knowledge of Judaism. Those years between Malachi and from uh, Matthew, it was a period that, it seems to be a dark period where it is they lived in apostasy and what have you. And as soon as, by the time Christ came on the scene, you know, uh, and uh, so on. You see, their minds were so dark, you know, and uh, they, uh, they, they have rejected the knowledge. They won't study the scriptures uh, to reveal the Messiah. And when, by the time Christ was in person among them, they, they, they had no idea who he was. They rejected him. They believed that what they believed was the right thing, and so on. My question to you is this: What, what? Why, why did God allow, or uh, uh, it, no choice? But weren't there some, certain, some remnant during that period from Malachi to Matthew, uh, where it is a, a remnant would have kept the knowledge and so on? And uh, uh, why was it like that? I don't know if you're able to answer that question because I've always, 
asking about that and nobody seems to be able to answer that. All right, let me see if I can answer it for you. But you know what I'm asking? This gap between Malachi and Matthew, when Christ came, and all this, you know, it's centuries between that time. And, and it seemed the Jewish leaders, they imbibe a certain error and evil and rejection and apostasy. So by the time Christ was there, so the White says when Christ was there, it was the height of evil, uh, you know, in the world. But yet it is, we don't see a revelation of a remnant who, who kept something, you know. And it's only when Christ came there, you see, uh, when he started to gather the disciples and so, you see that it's happening. What went on? Do you have any idea? There's no need for the Maccabees. When God is silent, that is when we are to be also silent. There's little con given concerning the life of Christ between age 12 and age 30. After the visit to the temple, we see not, I must be about my father's business. There isn't much written about him concerning his early years between then and then he came on the scene at age 30 when he was baptized to enter on his public ministry. Those 18 years are quiet. It does not mean that there was no truth, there was no people, there was no, Christ was growing and maturing and doing. He was not on his public ministry, but he was still a child of God and doing the work of God. As much doing the work of God then as when he was preaching the Sermon on the Mount. Between Malachi mm -hmm. and Matthew, remember that after the return from the exile, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, um, no, you, you put those books, you see, one of our mistakes is, we follow the chronology of how the Bible books are written and assume that that is written, no it's not, alright, those are not, books are not written like that, and those are not, those prophets, those minor prophets, prophesied back in the days of the kings of Israel, so the silence between there is when the importance of Babylon, and media Persia to the work of God had passed. Babylon was going to take them into captivity. Media Persia was going to free them from the captivity. So God mentions empires and nations when they have an impact on his work. So a lot is given to Babylon, where they took it into captivity. Brother Stefan referred this morning to the dream of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was writing from in Babylon because they were not more the captives. But when they were freed by the media Persian, Daniel um, from 5, when Babylon collapsed, 6, 7, 8, all the way down to 12, reveal the history of Israel from there right down to the second coming of Christ. And in between there, after Media Persia would have done its work to issue the decree, Israel was back as a nation and they were now functioning, would not return to the glory that they would have before because they had fallen away and there isn't much that the Lord could have do to restore them. So between Media Persia, the next empire was Greece. And there wasn't any impact upon of Greece really upon the work of God. And they were there wasn't anything they could do. God could only now wait until you get to the Messiah. So you are brought again between that and pagan Rome. When Christ, the Messiah, would come according to Daniel 11 from verse 21, 20 going on up. So the gap between here is because the work of God he knows is going to lie in obscurity, the next step would be the Messiah. The only thing he could do from here on now is to send the Messiah to give them a true revival and a reformation if they were going to receive it. This was his last offer to them before they as a nation would make their minds up to either accept or reject. So the silence between here is not because God did not have a true people as we see from the accounts of Luke and Matthew. When the Messiah was born, God had a remnant of those who were genuine Christians, Mary, Joseph, Anna, Simeon. Simeon. Those were handfuls of those who were sincere. And when Jesus started his ministry, those whom he called were walking the order like they had, and he called them to be his disciples to build up the church and get it ready because probation was going to close for the Jewish nation. But in that period of silence, was because where Israel had placed the Lord, and there isn't anything that he could have really done then to restore them uh, physically to do the work that he wanted them to do as a physical nation, he was now going to reestablish his order in terms of building up Christianity. Their probationary time was closing. So when 
when a nation or an empire don't have uh, that great an impact upon the word of work of God, God does not give them that much attention to his word because remember the scriptures is a record of his story, God's story, his work, and he doesn't put in all the details upon Greece because Greece didn't have any real impact upon the work of God, but it's there for the continuity. The Lord revealed the empires that would succeed between Babylon and pagan Rome when the Messiah would come, and he didn't put all of that because it was not um, relevant to the great projects. So you're saying that there were people even during that dark period who were held on in the Jewish nation, a few of them, but they, they weren't, you know, they were just, they weren't leaders, and, but they held on to truth. And eventually when Christ came, like these, who you call Annas and Simeon and uh, so on, they knew certain principles that were right, and they held on to that. And it's only when Christ came, and he chose the disciples to do that uh, magnificent work, then it is, it was, um, it was manifested. Yes, and there were those who were studying, because John the Baptist, was studying the prophecies of Isaiah um, and Jacob. The scepter shall not depart from Judah or, or log from Bethany until Shiloh come. And John said, Wait, then the king in Israel, but the, but the word of God the Messiah must be born. All right, the Spirit of God brought that conviction to his mind. By the word of God, the Messiah must be born, and that was based on prophecy. And others also were studying the prophecies to know the timing. They understood the timing that where they were. And this is the time for the Messiah to be born. So God has his true people then who were studying, maintaining the truth, and looking for the consolation of Israel. And it was given to Simeon that he was not going to die until he should see the Lord's Christ. He had his true people then, just that the church was not as prominent because they had gone down to an extent in obscurity. By the way. No, it's also saying it wasn't just only the uh, people in Jerusalem. He also had the wise men that came from the far east who also studying prophecy. Thank you. And that was based on prophecies from Balaam. They came from the land of Balaam all the way down there and they were studying to know about the Messiah and came. Now, if God could direct the wise men all the way to Jerusalem to find the Messiah born, tell me, was it not possible that Israel would have known or should have known about it? Yes. If they were studying way out and they did not have as much of the scrolls as the Jews. And if God could reveal it to them with a limited amount they had, mm -hmm. there was no excuse for Israel not to know when and where the Messiah was born, nor to be in tune with it, but they chose. And I want to say is that from there on, when Christ was born, because God bypassed them, you know, they were offended that the wise men came asking for the Messiah, you know? they were offended that God did that. Mm bypass them and give it to them and they set their hearts from there mm -hmm. to reject the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my um, question was really about the period from Malachi before the we went through Christ. this already. And from what I understand from this thing, uh, they were, the apostasy of the Jews was, uh, of course, it was, it, 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 it brought deep darkness among them. Even though they might be happy on one or two of them who is not really revealing in the middle of God. Uh, you know, concerning that period. It's like a period, like, like the one told the 260 years when the papacy um, darkened the minds of men from understanding the knowledge of the sanctuary. Uh, uh, because of the apostasies of those Jewish people um, from the time of Delta after Babylon and what happened and so on, and Nehemiah, they had sunken into apostasy. And by the time Christ manifested his ministry on the earth, these men's minds were so darkened with their the, the righteousness by works and their tradition and their policies and their what have you, they, they, they didn't recognize the Messiah. And of course, as you mentioned, um, there were heathen people who had believed the, the wonders of um, the works of, of God for the Israelite people, and they had, had some knowledge, like as he said, he mentioned the three wise men and so on. But it seems as if it is they put, uh, it's because of their choice and, and how they operated in apostasy that that period was a dark, dark period. And it was centuries of, of darkness, it seems. Wow. Yes, let me just add again. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament as it's outlined here. But it's not the last book in that series in terms of chronologies chronologically speaking before Matthew that is just how it is outlined and written but it's not the last book um, 
Esther would succeed that. Esther, Esther would be later than Malachi. Because Esther's book was written in the history of Israel and the Media Persian realm. Alright? And it was Babylon, Media Persia, Greece. There's no account of Israel having any dealings with Greece, so we don't have any book in the in the Old Testament of Greece's impact upon Israel because there's no real major impact and it's not recorded. But between the in the Persian realm, then you would have the whole Grecian Empire, which with a period of darkness, and you get a good uh, Rome came to ascendancy 168 BC. So between that and then the birth of Christ, which would be around, well, there's no year zero, but that's about 100 and. So those are the years were the, um, Grecian rule, Hellenistic rule. The, the what? The Greeks. Yeah, the Greeks. Godless people. The the ideology of the Greeks is advancing the work the world through education and knowledge. But a knowledge that is not founded in God is foolishness. So that Paul says in Romans one, first Corinthians one, he preached Christ to the Greeks, what? Foolishness to the Jews what? But to those who believe Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So God had no time for foolishness because the foolishness of the heart is no God, and since the Greek Reject the Lord, the Lord could not compel them to believe, bypass them, and look for those who would see the truth. And just one more thing. Those, these, these minor prophets, uh, uh, like Malachi and before them, Zephaniah and so on, they were contemporaries of Isaiah and all, all those things. Some of those, yes, were, were in those days, yeah. the kings, uh, the, mm -hmm. both Judah and Israel, written in those, even of those kings. They're called minor in terms of the amount of writing that they do, but their work was major because. If it was not, God would not put it in the hardest impact upon the work of God, and we just categorize them like that and put it and call minor prophets. But they were servants of God and they did their work in the days of those kings before they went about the captivity. Some of those in the minor prophets then work was after the captivity. Zechariah was to them after the, the captivity and spoke to them. So we can look at that in details and put them in a better order. Uh, another study. Alright? Let us close it. See you.